So welcome, welcome, welcome to Monday's, oh, I'm sorry, Tuesday's Q&A session. <laughs> Yesterday was a, the President's holiday, and so we, we uh, postponed our, our Q&A, which is normally on Mondays, to today. And so I'm, I'm pleased for those of you who can attend, and as well as, boy, have things been changing, Felicia. Yes, right? it's keeping us very busy. Very busy, yes. So <laughs> So again, I'm Dr. Deborah Dupree with Relationships at Work, uh, your IPM facilitator, and of course, Felicia Menta with the uh, Joint Powers uh, Authority and uh, Program Manager for Handling Workers' Comp for many, 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 what is it, 67 school districts throughout San Diego County? Yes. Very good. Very good. Well, we have a robust uh, conversation today for you. And I do want to first let you know, um, Felicia shared a just hot off the press um, article that I have put the link into the chat box that you can go ahead and access. Uh, we'll go ahead and also provide this in our follow-up uh, email, providing the recording to today's session, as well as any other resources we identify. So um, Felicia, getting started because boy, the changes, if we thought last month or, or the pre previous month were fast moving, uh, it, right. it, it's changing as we speak. And mm -hmm. so let's get off first uh, with the new supplemental COVID leave act. And, and what is that about? Well, uh, the new Senate bill uh, 114 uh, took effect on February 19th, 22. So it is uh, quite new, uh, but the tricky part was it's retroactive back to 1122 and, um, and it's effective immediately. So that made it very hard um, because it doesn't give employers, um, it's for all employers uh, that have over 26 employees and it doesn't give you a lot of time uh, to get everything set up with HR and payroll. The new law um, is a little bit different than the previous law that we had uh, for the COVID um, supplemental uh, sick leave policy. And it's in effect from 1-1-22 to 9-30-22. That's when it expires. The 2022 version is a little different than what we had um, last year as um, it includes um, two 40 hour periods that really you should look at in hours and not in days. I think that makes it easier. And uh, the el eligibility for those, um, what I call two buckets of the 40 hours um, is a little bit different. And so, you know, for full-time employees, they must've worked two weeks prior to the time off and the pay stubs have to have separate line items on them um, for this um, new supplemental paid sick leave. And um, so there was a lot of confusion in the beginning about the first 40 hours and the second 40 hours, right? Because the second 40 hours has uh, some uh, requirements of that you can require documentation of testing before you give the second 40 hours. So there are some differences from the prior law. Um, Athens did a very good webinar uh, that uh, I wanted to make available in the link that's a little bit over an hour with Q&A uh, because it's a little complicated, the calculation of this leave, uh, the posting requirements for this leave. Uh, this leave is basically available. Um, I like the wording that the employment attorney used. Uh, it is available immediately upon oral or written request. Um, but a lot of um, employers are going back to 1-1 and kind of looking at those. Uh, that already were in um, a sick pay or used PTO that might possibly have qualified for this retroactive leave, um, trying to figure it out. So because it was retroactive, it did, it made it a little tough because in some cases we've already paid workers comp leave, which now it's very clear in the labor code that this new supplemental um, COVID sick leave is to be applied first and then we would pay TD. We'll be addressing those on a case-by-case -case basis with Athens. Um, also, we I think we have a link, uh, Deborah, too, to the uh, sample of the poster for the notification requirement, and also a sample to the webpage um, for Sullivan and Associates. Um, today, appointment this afternoon. Um, so if her time gets extended, Multitasking so, as we go along. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, some of that, um, some of that uh, documentation and, and some of the rules in how to calculate 
Mm -hmm. um, the sick leave because it is a little complicated, some of the formulas for calculating it in hours. And it does have a maximum, I think it was $511 a day is the maximum. Mm -hmm. So you want to be aware of that because you don't want to overpay that leave. It does have a cap, just like our temporary disability has a cap. And um, so that's why I um, want to make those links available because obviously we don't have an hour to just go over um, this leave and who's eligible and who qualifies. Well, um, there are changes. So uh, I have a question because in a way before when the leave went into place with the prior act, that was also retroactive. And so it, mm -hmm. it, it was a lot of confusion though, a lot of extra work that we had to do. And uh, and so we've got the same thing happening here again. Uh, but the, like you say, the, the um, requirements, the eligibility, Etc. are different. And so, um, again, we will be making that link to the program mm -hmm. as well as the posters um, available after, in the follow-up. And I think those two buckets are a little bit different too, because when you think about the first 40 hours, the first, what I call bucket number one, they also qualify if they're caring for a child um, who's in school or, or daycare. Um, and that first 40 hours is paid based on their need to quarantine due to symptoms or doctor's orders or caring for a family member. And then it has that additional, if they're caring for a child whose school or daycare is unavailable. And then week two, what I call that second 40 hour buckets is the one where you can um, require them to test on day five. You can require a PCR test or you can take less than a PCR test is required for any employee to be eligible for any pay beyond the first 40 hours before week one. Um, and the test can either be for the family member that the employee is caring for or for the employee. And if there's no documented test result, then there would be no pay in that second 40 hour bucket. So the buckets have different requirements on them. And so that's why I wanted to make the links available to not only the webinar, but the notice requirements, because you want to notify all of the employees that this is available back to January 1st, because how can you require them to uh, tell you orally or in writing to request it if they don't even know that it's a law and that it's available. So that is the new 2022 supplemental paid sick leave, which is now in effect and retroactive um, to 1-1. Okay. And so in this regard, then again, uh, the employer responsibility, as it oftentimes mm -hmm. is, to be very proactive yes. and initiate uh, any of the pre-February um, uh, 19th um, issuances of um, sick or um, workers' comp leave to evaluate would they have qualified under COVID. Um, but going forward, then... Um, they they re respond to requests orally or written, right? Correct. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah, very, very interesting. So this is in place just to reiterate until September 30th, 2022. So we've got a few months ahead. Right. The prior COVID leave expired on 930. So right. this was further complicated by some, some of the employers, some of our school districts went ahead and extended that leave voluntarily, even mm -hmm. after it expired. Um, so that's going to be some changing of PTO and sick leave and, and banks, right? Um, right. And converting uh, leaves to other things because this is retroactive. Yeah. Well, we continue to be... Um inundated, shall we say, mm -hmm. <laughs> with, with changes. <laughs> HR and payroll are loving it. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yes, yes. Well, another um, area that is rapidly changing is um, uh, what's coming ahead with the new mask mandate. So uh, I know we've got a date coming up next week that is important mm -hmm. for us to take a look at. So uh, bring Very us up important. to date on what's happening. I, I, I've been, my head's been swirling around this one, so. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so uh, as everyone knows, Governor Newsom's uh, universal California mask mandate for all Californians ended for indoors on Wednesday, 2-16. Uh, for indoor settings. And then the California Health and Human Services Secretary, Dr. Mark Gailey, said that the state will wait another two weeks to decide whether to change its rules on masking for staff and students and visitors at our schools. Um, the state COVID-19 cases have dropped by nearly 75% since mid-January per the state's data. And on 228, um, the governor and state officials will reassess and they're gonna decide if they wanna move from requiring masks to strongly recommending them or whatever um, position they take. We'll have to wait to see 
on that further guidance on 228. Uh, what did happen that I thought was kind of interesting that I wanted to note here was um, LA County decided um, uh, to go ahead and keep their indoor mask mandate in place. So in Los Angeles, um, even though the California uh, mask mandate ended on 216, it did not end for LA County. LA County is continuing their um, masking um, indoors. I think they lifted their outdoor uh, mask rules and I did check, double check on LA Unified and I think they followed suit and did the same thing. LA Unified, <clears throat> was requiring masking outdoors and indoors for all staff, students, and visitors. And now they dropped the um, outdoor mask mandate was lifted and it's just the indoor requirement for LA Unified. Um, and then I also took a look at um, San Diego Unified on 216 also ended their outdoor mask mandate for their staff, students, and um, visitors. And then, of course, there's more to follow on this because on 228 is when we um, when we're going to get the updated uh, guidance. Okay, okay. So I'm curious um, because again, things have changed so much. I, you know, I, I read actively. I know you do too, but sometimes it's hard to sort of make sense of everything that's all happening. So with the outdoor masking um, requirement dropped in many situations. Um, you know, is, uh, what's the current status uh, that our listeners might want to know about in terms of social distancing and, and those kinds of practices? Well, so you, the previously, so certainly with us, you, you didn't have to wear your masks outdoors mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. San Diego County. Um, that was something that LA County was doing and LA Unified was doing, and I think San Diego Unified was doing it, but not all the schools were um, requiring uh, masks outdoors for the student staff. Um, but certainly the social distancing and the cleaning, I think our school districts have all been doing a great job. All of our schools, charter schools, our small and large schools have been doing a great job with, uh, with the masking and the distancing and with the cleaning. And obviously you can take your mask off while you're eating or drinking. Yeah. 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 Okay, I think last year, uh, mm. um, what per Dr. Gailey said in two weeks, he confirmed that the data, if the data continues to be where it is, they're taking the time, they're working and talking with school communities and communities at large, but they do anticipate making a change, you know, at that point. I think according to the state data, what I was reading this morning is the majority of the children 12 to 17 are fully vaccinated, uh -huh. almost 65%, okay. but children five to 11, um, it's just under 28% are fully vaccinated. So that's where the big, big difference is in yeah. the data. Yeah, yeah, okay. So again, more more to happen, and mm -hmm. uh, that's evolving, right? That that's an evolving picture there, and we certainly see you know different things happening in different places and mm -hmm. and so forth. And so um, it's just important to stay current with what's happening here in San Diego. Yes, yes. And so um, you know, one of the ongoing things too that we all have experienced since the onset of COVID is you know um, you know when COVID is contracted at work. And, um, you know, this is another area that really surprises me. It's really varied depending upon uh, region within the, the district. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I did a recent IPM where they said ever since COVID started, there only had been one incident of somebody mm -hmm. contracting it at work. And so that's pretty amazing, right. mm -hmm. you know, given how schools have opened and so forth. Mm -hmm. I really think they've done a good job mm -hmm. since the fall and especially coming back to school in January mm -hmm. um, in the middle of a, of a surge, right, after the, the holiday break. Um, but, but I do think that um, we've seen really good compliance with all our schools with um, within three days of their knowledge, entering their positive COVID-19 cases into the Athens portal. And okay. our schools have been doing a good job of um, doing the contact tracing and asking the employees if they think they were exposed at work to give them a claim form and advising them that they can file a work-related claim under Governor Newsom's law um, that COVID's presumed compensable um, in light of all the things that they've been doing and all the safety measures we have had relatively for the amount of employees over 45,000 lives are covered in our workers comp pool we have had you know I can count them on both hands the amount of 
workers' comp COVID-19 claims. We just had our first death claim filed last week due to COVID oh, okay. with one of our employees, um, but that's the first one we have seen um, since March of 2020. So I'm not saying we don't have work comp claims. We do, um, and that one's quite serious, but we... Um, we, we want them to be reported into the Athens portal um, if the employee thinks it's work-related so that we can get them over to the claims team to investigate them. We do investigate those COVID claims to determine um, transmission, uh, you know, if it's, if it's work-related or if it's related to home or um, outside, outside work. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, you know, you know, if somebody does file a claim, then then how is it handled in terms of investigation and so forth? And so um, that is pretty routine. And we, we actually need to know so we know where we can make further uh, interventions in the workplace mm -hmm. to you know, stop any potential spread. We certainly um, get a copy of the um of the COVID positive test, uh, mm -hmm. whatever test it may be, in order for the presumption to apply, it has to be a PCR test, but it can be an at-home test or an antigen test. We will, we will take different kinds of tests. It's just mm -hmm. in order for the presumption to apply, which gives us a shorter window to investigate claims, it has to be a PCR test. We've been receiving quite a few at-home and antigen tests recently on our work comp claims filed. The most important thing that we try to do with those claims is we try to do what I call a very quick investigation at the claims examiner level, talking with the employee to determine where exposure might have occurred. We only refer those out for investigation and statements formally if we need to. What we try to do is within the 14 days, um, in conjunction with the information we get from the district's nurses and the district's risk and work comp staff, um, we use that information. And then there are a lot of questions that the claims examiners ask the employees about where they think that they were exposed to COVID and where they've been you know, in the 14 days surround, be, prior to that positive test, not the results date, the test date. We really want to know where they've been and what they've been doing. Okay. Okay. And so it is a very quick turnaround. And so there's not a lot of delay in accepting a claim or not. We're trying to make decisions in two weeks on those claims. We're okay. trying to either make a decision to accept it. Yes, there was a student in class that was positive right before that they were exposed to right before they um, became positive with COVID or maybe a colleague that uh, tested positive. And then we try to look in, into if any other non-work related sources. But for the most part, I will say most of the claims that we have, we have made a decision pretty quickly. We're either gonna accept the claim as work related and pay benefits, or we're gonna deny the claim. And the denial language usually states your exposure, you know, you were not exposed in the work environment. Right, right. Um, any other nuances, uh, Felicia, that around filing claims in today's COVID world, aside from what we just talked about? Well, the death claim was kind of interesting mm -hmm. uh, because, um, and, and I was really glad that it was handled, the district really handled it. We talked about the best way to handle it. When the, the death occurred over the holidays and it was on break, that's when they found out, right? And, you know, within eight hours, we're supposed to call OSHA if we have any serious injuries, um, illnesses, or death. Um, related to work, but it doesn't have to be related to work. It can happen on campus. And we felt it was best after talking about the scenario, even during break, because they reached out to my cell phone on break when we, they were closed. And I said, let's call OSHA for best practice and just mm. to be safe. So we called OSHA and I said, and let's mail a claim form home to the widow and the family, letting them know that they have the right to file a COVID claim if they wish for this COVID death. And then we didn't receive anything. It, we, we called OSHA, we took care of that. We were just being proactive and nothing happened with the claim form for the longest time. And then the claim form came in, signed and they started the claim. Oh, and wow. if they had not provided that claim form, we would have had no ability to delay or investigate that claim because we didn't advise them of their rights, right? And so it's very important. Hindsight's always 2020, like, wow, that was handled perfectly. Um, but so it's a good thing to know when you have something serious happen, you want to reach out. And we had, even during the break, we had conference calls about what was the best way, what did we think the best way to move forward was with that? Yeah, it, it takes a village, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is important to get input from other other perspectives because they're, 
uh, it's a fast changing world. And so by, you know, communicating, collaborating, conferring with you, conferring with me about, you know, it's uh, actually, I think of one thing that um, uh, two attorneys I had on my podcast back in um, right after March, you know, the whole March thing happened and we had to quickly pivot what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I remember what was pointed out is that, you know, we have a lot of past practices that we can go back and look at mm -hmm. how have we done things before and how does it apply to what we're doing now? And, and, and to make sure that we're not making decisions about these kinds of things in a void um, and, and getting input from different perspectives. So I say that just because, you know, these, these are touchy times, shall we say, mm -hmm. and, uh, and people are impacted in oh so many ways. Um, and, uh, you know, particularly, uh, well, this sort of segues into our next, uh, next um, uh, question too, but, um, you know, obviously I, I watch what's happening mental health wise, you know, in the mm -hmm. workplace, because that's an area of my specialty as well. And, um, and so it's pretty interesting, you know, the, the rise of mental health issues that are um, uh, still emerging and mm -hmm. actually rising. And uh, there's a lot happening for organizations and workplace settings about um, how to improve upon access uh, to mental health strategies and, and, and how leadership um, is encouraged to uh, shift and adapt um, to looking at these things because they are real. They are. Um, they are. They can be serious. And so, um, you know, the question that I want to put out to you then is when, where, and how to hold an interactive process meeting. And I know we've had a couple of examples recently. Um, you know, and I always like. I'll start off by saying that I always encourage employers to. Uh, you know, be aware because again, an IPM gets started by the employee either presenting medical information about an existing condition, uh, and that's their obligation under the ADA as well as to, you know, particularly a new hire. You know, mm -hmm. but it, uh, if you're an employee in, in the work setting, letting your employer know that you've got a condition and that you know it may be impacting their ability to be at work, stay at work, or perform the work. The other way is that the employer may observe someone mm -hmm. having difficulty doing the job the way they did before. And so performance is a, a good indicator of how a medical condition may be impacting somebody. And so when I talk about performance, not just performance of the essential functions, but let's say we start having an attendance problem where mm -hmm. an attendance problem was not an issue before, you know, or maybe they're, they're arriving late to work. Again, not a problem before. Uh, all of these are indicators that there could be a medical condition that is operating now impacting their you know, mm -hmm. ability to effectively work. And then, of course, the third way is that um, you know, workers' compensation presents new information about the status of an employee's recovery and where they are in the workers' compensation process. And unfortunately, um, too often, uh, a lot of employers, not just school districts, wait until that somebody reaches maximum medical improvement. And then it's like, we have really little time to really work with that situation. So I guess I'm curious, you know, from your perspective, um, uh, Felicia, I know we've had a couple of really interesting examples mm -hmm. lately. And so I'll let you go ahead and tap into that a little bit. Well, we've, I get uh, lots of really interesting questions every week, so I can always use those uh, for our discussions. But I did want to comment on something you said. We're seeing a real rise in our psych stress claims. It's interesting. We don't have a, we had a little bit of a spike. We did after we came back in January with our work comp COVID claims. We did. But what we've really seen a rise in, and I'm sure you've seen it both on the non-industrial side and IPMs and industrials, is stress um, psych claims related to everything from workload, a lot of people are overloaded with work because of all of the additional tasks that have been um, added on to their kind of already full plate. And then some supervisors and managers um, in dealings with their employees. We've had stress claims um, come out of those uh, situations. Um, and go into work comp claims, right? Which is where we don't want them. We want them to be headed off in HR and dealt with there. So that's been that's been sort of um, an interesting, and it's funny, they're not COVID specific claims, but they're related to kind of the environment that we live in with COVID, especially with some of the increased workloads. But one of the questions that I thought was really interesting that came up was a school district uh, went through the pre-placement physical program that I also manage for new hires, and they had made an offer 
um, and I think this was um, pre-employment or maybe after the person started, they mentioned to the district that they had a, you know, a HIPAA protected uh, condition of AIDS. And the district, of course, did not ask for any information about this. And when the employee told them this information, they sort of stepped back and then said, ah, that sounds really HIPAA related. I don't know what to do with that. And they asked me, do we go to loss control? Do we go to safety? Uh, we don't know what to do now. So I thought it was so interesting that um, the practices that we use for regular employees and for work comp employees that have medical conditions also applies to new hires. But for some reason, a lot of um, HR doesn't think about that. They don't think about doing IPMs when things come up either in the physical exam um, where they might need to hold an IPM with a new hire. And so, yeah, I thought that uh, example was kind of interesting and, uh, and your take on that. Yeah, you know, I thought that was very interesting too, and um, uh, and that's why again to amplify what I just said, you know, it, it takes a village, and so it's really important to you know tap into different perspectives and how do we handle this. And I know my response to that inquiry was, um, you know, because it's a medical condition, uh, you know, actually holding the IPM would be actually a great confidential way to address the situation, because the fact that the the new hire had that type of medical condition was not the issue. It, it was really about, well, what risk is the employee at or others at given the existence of the condition? And that's where then the employer uh, would be right in being proactive to, mm -hmm. okay, well, how can we ensure that you and others are working safely? Thank you for acknowledging, because again, self-disclosure is their prerogative, mm -hmm. you know, but once right. you know, you know, that's why I said, you know, that how an IPM gets started is if the employee presents information. And so even if, you know, it looks pretty benign, shall we say, that oh, no risk here, it probably would be better to have an IPM to, to, to just clarify that, you know, um, that you've explored the situation, you've taken precautions, you know, that you've investigated or not investigated, but you've explored you know, just, you know, what concerns might the employee have? Um, how does it relate to the job being hired for? And again, how might uh, the condition present itself as a risk to others? And so, you know, we're, we're in the process of getting that set up then. But I will say too that um, many school districts haven't involved uh, the IPM uh, as far as I know, but I certainly have been involved in uh, a number of new hire or, or you know, new hire pre um pre-placement uh, physicals. And let's say somebody who is qualified to meet the job, but then may not pass the physical mm -hmm. quite as needed. Right. And so it'd be very important not to just, you know, mark this person off as a no hire, but instead say, okay, well, let's, let's understand the situation better. Um, what, what kinds of accommodations need to be made and is this appropriate to continue moving forward? Uh, because again, for alternative employment or new hire employment, they have to be qualified for the job first before mm -hmm. you engage in the interactive uh, meeting. And I'll give you an example of one situation where it wasn't entirely a school district per se, but it was a, an agency that provided services to a school district. And so they, um, they had interviewed, selected a candidate. She came to the job interview, uh, went to the, um, uh, you know, so, some other orientation. And then when she showed up for work, she showed up with a, a service dog. She showed mm -hmm. up with a whole list of um, functional limitations. And, um, and it was like, they were just totally bewildered. What do we do? Well, the employee has a responsibility in, you know, in the new hire process to review the essential functions of the job and to then determine whether or not they may or may not need an accommodation given the essential functions and work environment. This employee didn't disclose anything uh, about mm -hmm. any of her medical conditions. And so right. we, did, we did do the IPM. And uh, it was ultimately uh, determined that because of the nature of the position, um, it was not safe for her or others to perform the, the, the job in the environment necessary, um, given her physical limitations, but also just with access of, of the service dog. And so the offer was withdrawn and it was appropriate to do so. Um, but again, if in doubt, mm -hmm. right. best to have yeah. an IPM to protect yourself. 
Right. The other example uh, that I thought of that came up last week that was kind of interesting, that was a work comp claim. Um, the, the school district, this is a teacher that has been back to work for some time uh, within limitations on, on, with modified duty on work restrictions and teaching in her classroom. And so when um, the claims team got the permanent and stationary report, they sent that over to they sent that over to the district like they normally do, not the whole report. It just had the work restrictions and said, you know, do you want to meet with her alone more, you know, informally, or do you want to have a formal IPM process? And, and do you want to use a consultant or do you want to do this on your own? Like they normally do ask them what they want to do. And they said, we'll just have a chat with her. Right. So they, they had like a chat with her, um, very informal, the principal with the teacher. And then um, along comes the request for settlement authority to the district, uh, which tells them more information, right? That she had a total knee replacement, that she also has upper extremity problems, that she has a lot of work restrictions, that she has permanent disability, that she needs to have a settlement of her workers' comp claim because she has a lot of rateable permanent disability, that she has lifetime future medical care that's probably going to involve another total knee or another surgery on her knee. So now we have a complicated case. And the small chat that was very informal, that also the district did not do a letter offer of return to work, because apparently they didn't understand that that was part of the IPM process. And so the IPM didn't really get done, right? There was a chat, but that wasn't the real IPM. They didn't really go through the job description. They didn't go through the pretty severe work restrictions. They didn't talk about any other needs. And, um, so, and, and then they realized that also she's represented by counsel, right? So there were things that they should have done in a more formal matter, and they should have sent a letter offer of return to work if they were able to accommodate. They said, well, we can accommodate these, you know, these work restrictions. And I said, well, that's fine. But usually you have more of a discussion. You go over the job and the limitations and, and go over, cause she has lots of work restrictions from, and there were work restrictions from several different doctors, right? There were two or three different doctors right. that had treated her that had work restrictions. And so then they told me, okay, now we need to do an IPM. <laughs> and cause we, we really, we don't do a lot of these and we don't run into this very often. And we realize now this is more complex than what we thought it was initially. And, um, Sometimes you don't know what you don't know, right? Until it goes along, right? And when they first got the work restrictions, they thought, oh, this is no problem. We can accommodate. This is an easy situation. And then when they got a letter with more information about the, you know, sort of the expanse and breadth of what was going on in the comp claim, then they thought, uh oh, you know, we need to do, you know, a more formalized IPM process where we really go through everything with her to make sure, um, make sure that we can accommodate and make sure that we address all these issues. Yeah, yeah, that, that was sort of complicated. It's still a little bit complicated. Uh, we're still working through that. Um, so yeah, a couple of key points that I'd like to, to make around that is that, you know, certainly, um, you know, some people have been doing this a while. And again, if it seems pretty simple and straightforward, you know, hold the, you know, IPM informally, um, you know, or internally, I should say, um, because we have a lot of smart people out there who, who mm -hmm. in, in, in enough of these to, to have a, a good handle on how to do it. Um, where I recommend that they turn to a third-party resource such as myself is that when um, you know when the work environment, when the job task, you know, um, may be um, you know in more complicated environments, uh, as well as you know if it's real important not just take a look at work restrictions and say, oh, we can or we can't accommodate that. Mm -hmm. It really is important to go through the essential functions because sometimes we do find, even though somebody has limitations. It doesn't impact their ability mm -hmm. to be at work, stay at work, and perform the work. And if anything, when we just need to document that. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, I've just had a couple that the limitations were so significant, given the nature of the work, that there was no reasonable accommodation, nothing that was readily achievable. And um, by documenting it thoroughly and showing, uh, again, the ADA is looking for us to go through certain steps. Mm -hmm to verify, to have that more in-depth conversation. Otherwise you run the risk of, of not really providing an interactive process. And so by holding IPM, particularly when it's a work-related injury, um, now, you, now you're meeting not only the you know, compliance standards for the ADA and FIHA, but you're also fulfilling the workers' comp guidelines. And it needs to be done timely because otherwise uh, the school district remains at risk then for having to have the job retraining voucher offered 
uh, mm -hmm. if not done on a timely basis. And uh, as many of our listeners probably know, uh, we know that some don't, uh, that the Division of Workers' Compensation then requires uh, a notice of offer for regular modified or alternative work. And so the, the state tracks how when employees have been injured, how do they go back to work? And, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so then there's clear documentation on that basis, but then also uh, we need to have enough information to adequately complete those notices. And it needs to be signed off by the district and then signed off by the employee, again, all in a timely fashion. Then we turn it back over to Athens for submittal to DWC. Well, and what I thought was really interesting, um, when the settlement request came, they said, oh, we're going to talk, we need to have an IPM because we're going to talk about the settlement request. And I said, no, the settlement request and um, the, the request for authority to, to settle the case is really a separate issue from the IPM. There are times in IPMs where there is some discussion after if they're not able to accommodate and they're going to run through their leave and they want to know what other kind of pay is there. Sometimes there can be a discussion about, they can talk to their claims team or their attorney about permanent disability, permanent disability advances. These things can help them financially if it is the unfortunate outcome that they can't be accommodated and they're gonna go on 39 month rehire and lose their job. But um, normally they're separate. We completely decouple those conversations, right? Yes, yes. And interestingly, um, you know, even when we held the IPM, uh, it was still believed that the settlement uh, authority was going to be discussed. It's like, mm -hmm. well, okay, <laughs> yeah, not really how this happens, but um, so uh, yeah, it, it just is really critical um, to you know follow through the steps, and uh, it's real important then that school districts should be prepared for the IPM by making sure that we have the job description because then I, when I'm facilitating, I share it with everybody you know, via screen on the Zoom platform, uh, but then also that we have medical information. And unfortunately, even though that was laid out, nothing was available at the time of the meeting. So we really couldn't finish the meeting adequately. And, um, and so I really appreciate those who do reach out and say, do you have everything you need? Mm -hmm. um, you know, because yeah. I pretty much set things up as soon as I get a request and, and make sure I've got everything ready and even have my like the, started. <laughs> the one district that has a list and she sends you a list, right? Of, of all the things that have been done and then all the reports that she mm -hmm. has with all the work restrictions. Because usually there's not there's not always just one report. Usually there's two or three reports. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, one of the things I, I advocate also is that have the interactive process earlier rather than later, um, because, uh, you know, it's real important that we not make assumptions about what people can and cannot do. And um, uh, in that we really have that, that, that careful conversation. And one of the things about having an IPM earlier in somebody's um, medical um, recovery is that now you have an opportunity to educate and inform employee about the process, the laws involved, the timeframes associated, mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, one area I see um, used not as effectively as I'd like to see is around the you know, temporary modified duty. Um, mm -hmm. It's oftentimes extended way beyond what's practical and uh, actually puts the, the district into an awkward position. Then when mm -hmm. they try to move, remove it or um, it's not working any longer. And mm -hmm. so again, it's always a balance. What does the employee mm -hmm. need and what does the employer need? And so we mm -hmm. always have to take a look at, um, you know, is temporary modified duty even doable um, mm -hmm. given the work environment? Uh, and then to also be aware of, um, you know, could the employee be returned to temporary modified duty? Um, let me restate that. Return to temporary alternative assignment by being placed somewhere else temporarily. And so um, I know I had somebody who uh, usually worked in a more active kind of position, but temporarily um, she was placed into an office setting where she mm -hmm. um, had some skills related that she could still perform you know, functional needed work, um, but was more physically appropriate to her during her recovery. So, um, and then to, to, if somebody is not improving during those first 60 days, uh, or in some cases, some school districts have 90 days, um, do not continue the temporary modified duty because if they're plateauing or even getting worse, then that suggests being at work is not the, in their best mm -hmm. interest. Normally right. being back to work while during recovery is a good thing. But um, again, that's why we have to do it on a case by case basis. Right. 
right? Yeah. That's how I try to always look at everything because a lot of districts will say, well, we did something else on this other site claim. We didn't do this. And I said, I really like to look at each case on its own merits because they're all a little bit different. They're all a little bit unique. So we can't really use the cookie cutter. We did this, so this is what we do on site claims. Yeah. And, and that site claim was interesting because we've been engaging um, because she, her psych restriction was she couldn't work at the site with her principal, right, as a school secretary position. And so then that became difficult, right, because the person almost needs to work in another location. If they can't work at or around their supervisor, they have to work uh, at a whole different site. So it became challenging, right, trying to find temporary accommodated duty and trying to uh, um, get the employee, you know, back to work, right? Which is what, what the district's trying to do, essentially. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, there is one other um, quick example I'll share uh, that um, because of, it ties back to the mental health issues that we talked about earlier, because the, you know, pandemic has, you know, been so protracted, much, much longer than any of us mm -hmm. ever, ever thought would happen, that um, this is where we've been seeing new mental health issues develop because of the ongoing um, nature of, you know, safeguards and limitations and things like this, and then with the variants as well. So um, having a situation where um, the fear of, you know, contracting COVID became so great, it led, led to a state of anxiety and other physical symptoms. And um, and so the principal tried to work with her and, and did, um, and, but it meant uh, working outdoors, uh, you know, seeing her students outdoor in outdoor settings mm -hmm. and not being inside for any group meetings or things like that because the fear was so great mm -hmm. about being exposed to. And um, we did have a recent IPM and um, it's like, okay, well, now you've been accommodated way beyond the, the maximum time frame, and we still have four months left of school, and mm -hmm. you know, the guidelines are changing, you know, and it was starting to create some hardship. Uh, both under That would be a hard restriction. You mean that she couldn't work indoors, in person with students, even with masking? Yeah, um, she, right. was, oh, she was only supposed to work with students one-on-one uh, -on -one indoors um, on a crisis basis, mm, okay? okay? Yeah, so complications, and so mm -hmm. it's like, well, this is not doable indefinitely, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, and so I've got it scheduled for follow-up next week anyway, because now it's like um, with the uh, changing mask requirements, then mm -hmm. that fear could even go up even further, and so taking her off work may, may have to be the course of action. I don't know yet. So I did have um, a long uh, call with Dr. La Palusa and Dr. Ray who treat, uh, they're QMEs also, but they mm -hmm. treat a lot of our psych stress claims because they're on our MPN. And that was one of the things that they said that they've been seeing because they treat a lot of our injured employees that file um, mental um, health or psych and stress claims for our school districts. And, you know, we provide treatment, even if we're delaying and investigating the claim. So they treat a lot of our injured employees. And they told me that they are seeing a real rise in anxiety from just the length of time that this has gone on and um, the, uh, the being back in person. And uh, some people can handle it and deal with the fear and it's okay. Um, and they can function and they can perform all their duties. And some people, it really uh, starts developing a condition for them, right? It really starts yeah, to become Yeah. So making sure that people are informed about access to employee assistance programs are, is critical mm -hmm. uh, and not, um, shall I say, poo-pawing <laughs> some of mm -hmm. these stated concerns around mental health because they are real. And mm -hmm. uh, people do develop you know, um, physical effects of them as well. And, um, but we always have to get balance what are the needs of the, the um, employee and what are the needs uh, of the employer, including delivery of services to students. Yeah, I agree. Yep, great. Well, Felicia, once again, thank you for being here today and uh, you know, navigating this journey, uh, you know, about um, working with employees with medical conditions in the workplace. It's taken on a whole new face. Uh, in 2020 mm -hmm. and 2021 and into 2022. And mm -hmm. uh, we'll be continuing to look at all these emerging issues. And um, again, as a reminder to our listeners and viewers, uh, we will be sending out a recording of today's session so you can uh, share it with others later on, as well as the resources that Felicia so kindly provided to us from her recent Athens uh, workshop or webinar. So thank you again, Felicia. 
Oh, it's my pleasure, Deborah. Okay. And for everybody else, we hope that we get back on track with our, um, uh, usually it's the second Monday of the month. And, uh, but with holidays in February, it got moved around a bit. So um, uh, look forward to hearing your feedback and uh, look forward to the next one coming up in March. 